I believe there's a significant amount of uh, hope. Um, and, and maybe we learn by some of these lows that we, we've gone through somehow. But, um, you know, people still need to eat. Um, we've got we've got a extremely um, economical source of protein, not only for um, um, you know our 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 Canadian citizenship, but much beyond that, right? So um, you know that that is the hope that that you know we work with, saying that you know people need what we have. Welcome everyone to today's episode of Swine It Canada. I am Dan Columbus and I will be your host for today's episode. And with me today, I have Rick Bergman, who is currently president at Buckingham Egg and was past chair of the Canadian Court Council. So uh, welcome, Rick. And how are you today? Yeah, doing great. Really good to be here with you, Dan. Yeah, we're really excited to have you on and, and looking forward to the discussion. Um, before we get going on that, though, just because some people might not be familiar with who you are and what you've done, I just ask you to introduce yourself and kind of, you know, wh- how, how you've got to where you are today. All right. Very good. So um, first and foremost, I'm a producer from Southeast Manitoba. Uh, you know, my wife and I, we started way back in, in the mid 80s. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time ago. So uh, we started farming uh, way back then and still are doing that at a different capacity now, uh, really enjoyable. Through that timeline, it was, um, you know, there were opportunities to get involved in our local uh, provincial pork organization. And uh, that was a, a, you know, a big passion of mine to be involved in, in, in different areas and capacities. So that kind of got me in the racetrack of pork politics uh, at, you know, at a certain level. And throughout all of those years, I uh, had opportunity to, um, you know, serve and help producers out uh, at the provincial organization. I've been uh, in the past quite involved with the national organization, um, retired from the chair position this last January, but uh I uh, was involved as a chair for eight years there and actually have been going to Ottawa for 15 years in, in, in total. So that's the the journey, the pork journey that, that we've been on. So we've seen, my wife and I have seen a lot of ups and downs in the sector, a, a lot of change. And and uh, I foresee more changes to come in, in different ways. The Nutrition Athena, Shakespeare Mill, Farmhouse, and Nutrition Partners Nutrition Group offer the full range of nutritional product based on extensive research and developments, and a solid team of experts all across Canada. Our objective is to provide cost-effective solutions, innovation, and support to producer from the entire Canadian swine industry. Yeah, d- definitely some some interesting times lately. Uh, somewhat of. You know, that's just the, the cycle that pork goes through. Um, but I'm sure, you know, being involved at CPC for eight years and, and you know, it just in general for 15 years, like you said, much longer. I, I'm sure I'm sure you've seen a lot come through. So maybe uh, we'll start the discussion today by maybe, you know, what are some of the things that you've learned uh, from the past? And then maybe we can um, delve into, you know, what we see coming through in the future. Right. So I would say in the past, um, you know, when when you see different um, uh, different functions, different meetings, and 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 so on, it's really um, great to see people care uh, about about our sector. So, you know, we're uh, I love shoes and sweaters and pants, but we're one up, and like we're actually making protein for the world to eat to live. And that's a pretty noble um, job. So uh, amongst all of that, though, you have different spheres around you, um, sometimes um, not helping you, but hurting you, whether that would be the aspect of swine health or political issues or trade issues. So, uh, you know, for me, it was just a big enlightening when when. Uh, 
you know, I was experiencing from, you know, being in the, in the, in, in the barn seven days a week to being able to get involved at these different levels where to, um, you know, a point where, you know, when we're in Tokyo, when we see Canadian pork on the shelves there and, and you're talking to the buyers and, and they want what we have. So that's pretty cool. So with that, we've got a huge job to make sure that that train keeps on going, that, uh, that, that the, the momentum and all the good things we do are continue to be recognized not only in, in, in markets in Asia, but around the world. So, uh, again, that was, for me, that was a, a pretty good growth experience just to be, be part of that and to see that. Yeah. I, I think it's, and maybe people are, are more aware of it than we, than we think. Right. But, you know, Canada is one of the major exporters and is feeding the world. And I think that is great. Um, the other thing, and, and, and I was getting, some of this ready for for some lectures coming up this fall to teach the young people about pork production. And one of the questions that I was going to ask is then maybe what what are some of the benefits, but then also the pitfalls of being that you know that largely exporting country and may, maybe having been at the the you know CPC and dealing with something like that, you'd have some insights into that. Yeah. So you know when there are these geopolitical issues and processing plants get delisted. Uh, that really uh, shackles uh, or or handcuffs the processor in in that export trade to those different countries, and and that flows right down back to the farm. So, huh, although we might say we're all independent in different ways within our businesses, we are so ultra ultra connected, and, and that that can't be forgotten. And, and and that and that's why you have organizations like the Canadian Meat Council, where you've got the, you've got processors, you've got producers uh, that that are there. Uh, Canada Pork or Canada Pork International is what it was called before as well. You've got you've got uh, processors and producers around that table, and that's that's really critical to to ensure that there's dialogue uh, around those tables. Um, to really help each other versus uh, work against each other, and and uh, I mean if we if we work against each other, um, you know, history says that's not a not a great solution, right? Yeah, it's it's all one industry. I make I make that argument all the time when we talk about Eastern Canada pork and Western Canada pork, and I'm like, but it's all pork. We're all trying to get to the same outcome, right? Yeah, and I would <laughs> even say. Um, you know, when, when we talk about pricing in North America here, you know, you say Eastern and Western Canada, uh, and I'll also include the United States in this, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can get pork off of our uh, off of our, our, our lands in, in, into other parts of the world, that really creates this momentum, this strong momentum. So uh, there's a lot of interconnection like you say, East and West, but over the years I've been involved with CPC and the relationships we've been able to develop with our American colleagues. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of intertwined business going on right now, whether it's, you know, feedstuffs going, uh, coming into our can, uh, into our country, whether it's ice or weans or, or pork going down into the U.S. or pork coming up into Canada. And on and on and on and on. So it's a very interconnected business, uh, which, which um, I think there's strengths there that we can we can focus on for the future. Mm -hmm. I since since you mentioned the U.S. and and that trade and like you said the the movement of of pigs down in there, I think it's a good thing to potentially ask about maybe your opinion or what you see as as. Um, challenges with proposition 12 i mean this has been a, a major thing that's come up and and was a lot of discussion down in the u.s you know we've had other people uh come on this podcast and talk about how this might affect canada so where, where do you see that going in the in the future yeah you know bottom line it's not it, it, it's it's just not good for us so you've got in our in our country here producers are in the process of going uh to loose housing some have implemented it there's more to come. 
I think approximately half the cell base has gone that way. And, and, and now when you have a prop 12, which m might not at all uh, create in ex inclusivity uh, of, of all the the effort and the cost that the Canadian producer has ha has put on his farm to go loose housing, uh, certainly that's certainly that's a concern. California for Canada is about a just under a billion dollar market, nine hundred or eight hundred uh, million somewhere in there. So I mean, it, it's 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 significant, but uh, it, you know it's a real concern when you have you know one area try to influence a, a greater area, and, and again, I think it, it, education is key where where people might not understand what they're voting for with the prop 12 you know in some states so um for sure it's a concern yeah i, I and i've seen that at presentations too where it's like they, they get these questions on the ballot and it's like well do you want to make a pig's life better well who's going to vote no for that <laughs> exactly right? but, the, but it's the, it's the science behind it and not understanding what that's going to result in the industry yeah you know very leading questions and and <laughs> I think at the day at the end of the day, Dan, if if uh, if all of a sudden there's a reduction of pork or bacon going into California, I think people are going to wake up and they're they're going to miss that smell <laughs> and that taste. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the challenge is is clear with that one. Do, is there any potential opportunities that were maybe that might come out as a result of this? Well, we'll see what the Might outcome is. The spot. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, we're going to see what the outcome is is going to be. I don't think it's, I don't think it's over. Our, uh, you know, our our colleagues in 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 the south have been working hard on this uh, as far as the the political National Pork Producers Council and the, the different state organizations because it's very impactful. And so we have a lot of things that are are becoming very impactful in, in our businesses and. And we have to be careful because at the end of the day, we don't want that that one straw to break the camel's back. Because, uh, as you know, it's uh, pork production isn't for the faint of heart. There's, as as you know, right now the economics are are rough, and, and you know you 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 see big big challenges going around. And um, and again, we're 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 producing a protein for the world to consume to 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 be able to live um with so um i'm pretty passionate about that side of things so um food security is is also I maybe mean, years ago i was in a in meeting in in eastern canada in ottawa and just you know talked about how food uh is a privilege and i was corrected and said no no food is a right and i went well no it's it's not actually you know ask ask some people around the world outside of our country. And, and so some of my ancestors, they didn't have enough food to eat. Some of them actually perished because of starvation uh, way mm -hmm. back. So I'm relatively new Canadian. My dad was four when he came across in 1925. So all of those stories um, are, are still close to me. Uh, and and we, we can never say never because we've seen uh, the conflict in the Ukraine right now and how that has been major, has had major impact in a negative way. Um, so, you know, we food security and, and, uh, and uh, topics like that are starting to be talked about m more. And I think it's high time. I, I, I really believe we should keep that conversation going. And again, pork producers are a big part of that conversation. Yeah, it's interesting when you say that, you know, food food is a privilege. And I think also to go beyond that, you know, cheap food is a privilege. And the fact that I still remember this from my undergrad where one of the profs was saying how, you know, in Canada, it's it's looked at as a benefit when or a positive when people are spending less of their income on food every yeah. year over year, right? And maybe this is a, a, a particularly, uh, I mean, inflation is obviously having something to do with it, but maybe this is also kind of a wake up that, you know, your food actually costs more than what you've been paying for it. And especially if you're starting to want to have all these additional uh, uh, requirements put on how, how your food is grown and raised. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, a spoke in that wheel is the fact that, you know, 
there are some pretty strong estimations of how world population is going to bloom. It's going to continue to grow. And, and, and you know, we, their agriculture in general has had a lot of pressures on it. Um, but yet, if we're going to have more people around the world, how do we prevent major catastrophic scenarios of starvation? Because if, if, there's, if there are those concerns now with food security in some countries, um, un unless we continue to do the good work and build on what we're doing today, there's going to be more of the same, and and again, uh, you know, that's a pretty big motivator for me to, to uh, or has been in the past to be involved like I have been. So when it comes to the food security around the world, and I know the big talking point is the increase in population, and we say how we have to increase production. But I've heard on the other side of it, you know, that it, it's not necessarily production that we produce more food than we need to feed the world, but it's those supply chains. So what what are your thoughts on that, and and how much needs to be maybe put into that? Maybe maybe it needs to be a balance. Yeah, well, so first of all, production uses a lot of um, feedstuffs and feed grains that are not able to go into the human market. So number one, number one, a little bit off topic, but we're a great recycler, right? And instead of these these products that are unable to go into the human market being wasted, uh, agriculture and specifically pork producers are able to utilize those. So, uh, you know, that's a that's a huge benefit. Um, the ability for us to uh, to grow on that um, is there, but again, there's a lot of geopolitical um, scenarios that could come up and and, and really negatively uh, inf influence you know the th the things we do. So I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but but. Um, um, where the this is the supply chain certainly has had some major hiccups over the last couple of years as we know specifically through the pandemic and so on in some ways that has has tapered off and so on but also um uh, I, I i believe a lot of those hiccups ha have gotten improved upon uh, but we also have to be prepared where the just-in-time scenarios like we live have have lived with, those need to be looked at and and see if if there's a better way. You know, as bad as as COVID was, it did teach us some things about how how things work and what how they don't work and how fast it can fall apart. I think that's been surprising to a lot of people that, <laughs> yeah. and how difficult it is to get it up and running again once once it once it collapses. Right? We all thought it was such a smooth system, but <laughs> yeah. I, I guess that kind of leads into the the next question that I had when uh, you know we talk about. In general, there's that pork cycle, right? Where it, it, it's a boom and bust type thing. Uh, the, definitely, right now there there's some different challenges, and and having seen this for for quite a uh, few decades, uh, you know what what makes this time different, or, or maybe what makes it the same as, as what we've seen in the past, and and how do we, you know, what what, what can we do about that? You know, one of the big challenges that we've had is cost production has just skyrocketed. Right. So, you know, you, you know, you, you have a farm that's got a half a million dollar line of credit uh, that they would have had five years ago. It doesn't work anymore. You know, it just be just because of the grain prices and and commodity prices, uh, the inputs. Um, so that's that's uh, one that has set us apart, I think, from from other um, other cycles. Um and, and again, I would say, you know, previous cycles, it didn't seem like there was uh, the geopolitical trade challenges like like we do have today. So it's in, in some ways, it's a bit of a perfect storm that's occurred. Um, so, uh, you know, producers are extremely resilient and and uh, which which is great. But this one. This one has been tough because you you know you're playing with you're playing with bigger dollars to produce that market hog, for example, uh, just because of some of the things like feed costs and and you know labor never goes down it goes up just like utilities and and on and on. So 
This one, uh, I think that would be one of the reasons why it's kind of different than some of the other uh, the cycles that we've gone through. It, it, it might sound dire. I just can't think of a different way. But is, is there cause for hope? <laughs> you know, move, <laughs> moving forward. It, um, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I believe. I believe there's a significant amount of uh, hope. Um, and, and maybe we learn by some of these lows that we, we've gone through somehow. But, um, you know, people still need to eat. Um, we've got we've got an extremely um, economical source of protein, not only for, um, um, you know, our, our, our Canadian citizenship, but much beyond that, right? So... Um, you know that that is the hope that that you know we work with saying that you know people need what we have now the within some of those challenges of course is the the, the you know the topic of of uh, swine health and without the health of of the animals on our farms without that uh then we're then we're in really really rough shape and you know, if you read the news this morning about Sweden, how they 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 acquired ASF uh, over the last uh, fifteen or twenty hours, so hey, you know that's the big one in, in North America here. So uh, again, on the swine health side, we have to do all we can to keep our animals healthy uh, and uh, and and get ready for that that swing around that that turnaround, so we can you know capture. Maybe make some of the money back that that has been lost. You, you mentioned swine health and and ASF has been big on everybody's minds. I think that's the obvious one. But what are maybe some other challenges that are coming forward, say, in the next 10, 20 years when it comes to, to pig health? And, you know, how, how do you see us addressing that? Yeah, so loaded question. So my disclaimer is I'm not a veterinarian. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a pork producer. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would say... First of all, on the topic of ASF, and there was recently a forum in the U.S. where Mexico and, and the U.S. and Canada, uh, you know, uh, got together again. It wouldn't have been the first time uh, just to talk about ASF and the prevention and so on. I don't know of one file in, in our in our country through our our pork sector that has been worked on and dedicated so much time and money and effort to is is asf and and preparedness prevention obviously and so on um i mean back in the day when when my wife and i started farming the the disease the big one that just was so concerning was something called rhinitis or bullnose uh commonly known and that was it like that was you know that that was one of the big ones right and as you know over the last couple of decades there's been you know a bunch of a bunch of nasty ones showing up. So, um, you know, things like viruses like like PERS, for example, you know, when they continue to mutate and find different strains and, and on and on, you know, that's that's really impactful on the farms. Uh, PDV, you know, what was it in 2014? It was really impactful for the U.S. for the first time. And then it got into Canada and uh, the province where I'm from, Manitoba, this last year, we've had a tough go. We've had a really tough go with, with PDV. So uh, we just have to be very cognizant of the fact that let's not look at, at all the diseases that we have now and in the past, but actually look at you know uh, some of the mutations that could occur that would impact our future and do the best we can to to prepare for them. And I I believe there are opportunities and ideas to actually prepare for some of these, uh, as, as some other countries have done. Uh, so we just have to, you know, do the same thing. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about the preparation because, again, I'll, you know, we, we tend to go back to COVID a lot. But we found we weren't prepared. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, when, when it comes to these things, like what would be some of those suggestions on, on how do we prepare for this and maybe be a little bit better, um, you know, able to handle it when it, when it does happen? Yeah, so my perspective would be, um, so there are there are currently tools being used around the world that are not being used in Canada. So 
for example, there's unique feed ingredients that that are are creating some pretty cool benefits, uh, both economically but also in disease prevention. And um, in talking with some of the some of the manufacturers of these products, you know, some of these products are are in over fifty different countries, but they're not in 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 ours. And and the challenge there is um, the the cost of time and, and money uh, to get them approved in our in our country. So I believe there's an opportunity there to maybe scrub scrub that a little bit. Um, that would be a big passion of mine because uh, you know when you, when you see and uh, you know with your skill set as well when you when you see. Uh, value that is being brought in different sectors of the world, uh, it's it's actually imperative for us to have those same tools. Number one, uh, to keep our producers as efficient as they possibly can and to not only maintain but to grow on the story of, of the Canadian pork story where, again, you know, there's about 90 different countries around the world that want what we have. So our obligation is then to be continue to be cutting edge, to continue to have the very, very best so that that 90 countries, um, those raving fans continue and we can, you know, grow up, grow on that. It's definitely been, been frustrating even more so over the last couple of years, trying to test some of these ingredients and, 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 you know, other things to, to see what effects they have and to show that. But like you said, the, the process is so onerous to actually allow it to be used even for research, you know? Mm. So maybe just if anybody at the agencies is listening, <laughs> maybe yeah. just take that in, right. And, and say, you know, like we're, 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 we're almost, we're hurting ourselves by not being able to, to, to bring these in. Yeah. And, and, you know, my point within all that is not not saying anything, uh, you know, negative. So there's a lot of good people within the agency, within CFI. Mm -hmm. you know, there's extremely talented people, but they're also they're bound by regulation. They're bound by by policy, right? And that's where uh, organizations, provincial organizations, the the national CPC. Uh, you know, different different um, um, uh, associations can can get involved and 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 show the need and and often yeah. that's all it is is where there's an where there's a need and and you know my my opportunity to have uh, had conversations with with uh, different uh, federal ag ministers uh, has been extremely enriching for myself because the fact that. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of dialogue where there's there's true um, concern and, and and care, and and I'll say, you know, they they get it right. Yeah. So yep. I I think you know some of those policies just need to get scrubbed and and, and let's go because we we got we, you know we got to we got to ramp up and and get ready. No, definitely, I, I agree. It is you know they're they're bound by the regulation. It's it's the whole. I just work here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but. But it is, it, it would be nice to be able to to bring some of these and test them and actually use them within Canada. So, hopefully, yep. you know, like you said, we can scrub those and maybe clean them up a little bit. I'll I'll ask you now because you you mentioned you know the 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 different organizations kind of getting involved and having these discussions, but and you you yourself have been involved you know in a lot of this for over the years. So, how how would you suggest if if you know a producer or somebody else within the pork value chain wants to kind of to get involved and and you know be that advocate and stuff like how how would they go about doing that? Well, we're fortunate in our in our country to have uh, you know provincial pork organizations, uh, and and that's where it really and that's where it really starts. So uh, these pork organizations are driven and run by producers. And um, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, you can be an advocate, you can be a director, uh, you know, for these organizations. That's a great place to start. And, and it helps 
uh, tell our story. You don't necessarily have to be part of these because within our communities, within social media, and you see some pretty cool, um, uh, you know, things on social media where producers are just telling their story, right? They're, uh, you know, in our in our business, we've got some customers that that actually they go on social media and they're just telling their story, what they do and why they do it, and and it's like, yeah, right on, and 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 hopefully. You know that spreads the, the the good word about you know all the good things that we do. So you know different ways like that. I mean, we can all. I mean, if we all want to be, we can we can start picking away at every you know everything. But uh, I would say in general, uh, you know, through through the many producers that I've had opportunity to meet and and to um, spend time with across our country just outstanding, you know, forward thinking people. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity to help. And I'll say this in a nice way, educate government as far as, you know, why we do what we do and, 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 uh, you know, the benefit, the benefits of what we bring. So uh, we're a huge, massive economic engine, which not a lot of people know. And, and so that's where we have to go tell that story and, and get involved in, in these different areas. So I, I, I think before we get to kind of the, the take home and everything, I'd like to end, I guess, more on a high note, because there's been a lot of challenges that we've discussed. So what, what do you see as some of the opportunities, you know, coming forward uh, in, in the next 10, 10 years or so? Yeah, so um, for sure, I believe that that over the next decade, some of these these opportunities are going to be um that we're going to be recognized more and more as a solution um for food security uh preventing you know food hunger in in different areas of the world and so on um here here in our country when when you're when you're eating you have a plate in front of you you just go right where we've all been in different countries where we've had that experience and something's in front of us and I go, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know what's all behind this. So, so, you know, we, we've got a strong on farm program. So over the next 10 years, that will, I believe, continue to be um, a shining star in, in all the things that we do. And that will really benefit, uh, you know, the, the pork producers here. So, um Continue trade. I, I believe that's going to grow. Uh, I you know the the topic about these different ingredients and opportunities. I believe over the over the next ten years, those will uh, the pathway to get them here and in the system. I believe will be improved upon, and that'll be great as well for for producers because if they can mitigate some of their costs, and also at the same time improve the health of the animals then then we're you know then we're we're we've got we're rocking with jet fuel right so that's that's at the end of the day that's every producer just wants to be able to walk in their barn see their healthy animals continue to give them good care and 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 know that there's a a, a chain different links in that chain but down those links a very very solid export program for for getting the pork out of the country because we we need to do that as a as a as a country as you know we we would export about seventy percent of what we produce so it's it's vital for us. I think well, obviously it's an industry that's always been full of opportunity and people that are willing to take advantage of that and and grow right. It's just it's it's hard to see sometimes when you when the costs and everything just keep mounting and and yeah <laughs> you know things are closing and everything all the time. So I think it's good to discuss that, you know, there, there is opportunity to move forward. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So before we get to the, our final three questions, I just would give you the opportunity, you know, if there's one or two take home messages that uh, you want the listeners of today's episode to, to kind of get, you know, what would those be? Oh, gee, uh, I have about 14 or 15 of them. So I'll, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to hold you to two. <laughs> You know, um, you know, one thing I'll do is I'll focus on on trade. And I mentioned, you know, we're we're exporters to 90 different countries. Uh, the CPTPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, 
right now, um, the, the concern right now is, or the opportunity is that the UK uh, could be joining uh, this, this alliance, which is great. But there's non-tariff barriers that they're implementing. So we're buying a lot of their product. They're really not buying a lot of our product. And, and, and they're finding reasons not to. So, um, you know, with allies, you have to work together and, and accomplish the same goal. And that same goal is, you know, let's let's trade back and forth. So that would be, you know, one, one of the things that um, – uh, needs to continue to be focused on, and and again, you mentioned then, uh, you know, Prop Twelve and some of these these uh, these arrows that are continually being flung at us. We, we have to uh, ensure that we are not influenced to the point of of uh, the business not being appealing anymore, right? So for new entrants, number one, it's tough for new entrants to begin with. Let's not make any tougher, right? Let's let's actually do the other and and, and help, uh, you know, help the next generation because um, as society goes, there's still you know needs of food for for people to consume, right? Yeah. So briefly, that's a, you know a few points that I would have. Yeah. No, good good points, and I'm sure people can talk contact you if you if they want the whole fourteen. <laughs> the take home points. <laughs> I think I just scared everybody away when I said 14. <laughs> They're not going to call this guy. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be somebody that wants to know. It's time for our famous three. Okay, be- before I let you go, we ask our host or our guests, I, I say, I'm the host, so I've got to ask myself these, the same three questions, uh, a little bit unrelated to the topic that we've been um, discussing so far. So our first question is, what is your favorite go-to swine or agriculture related resource? Wow. Well, I'm a bit of an info junkie when it comes down to swine, uh, you know, the topic of swine and, and everything around it. So certainly podcasts like this, swine it and so on. Uh, you know, the Canadian pork press is, is, uh, has, has good information, swine web, pork business, I mean, the list goes on and on. Every morning, actually, one of the first things I do when I wake up is I look and I got about, you know, 10, 10 different feeds that, that come in. And it, it just it keeps me up to date as far as where we are, uh, not only in our province or our country, but around the world. And, and that's that's important because um, everything changes so fast. Right. So uh, there's. I would say maybe back in the day, people could live with their head in the sand and, and, you know, things would go by them and they might not have noticed, but we can't afford to do that now. So, yeah. you know, those would be a few of them. Yeah, I, I have a lot of those emails that come through too. And I, I'm guilty though, a lot of them get deleted sometimes. Because it's just way too many. <laughs> Information <laughs> overload. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so our next question, and this can be, so any anything, but a favorite book or something that you've read recently or even in the past that, you know, you kind of just keep going back to or, or was particularly influential? Yeah, great question. So uh, I like balance in life. Uh, like I, uh, if you, if you have, if, if you just focus on, on, on business and that's easily done, that, that's one thing, but you also have to have balance within your whole life. So, you know, as I mentioned, I read a lot of poor things on, on the non side, uh, I like that balance and perspective from the Bible. I like perspective from Max of Cotto, from John Maxwell, and others, where it just creates um, the, the balance. And I think as a as a driven entrepreneur, uh, for me, that's really important because you can really get off base and just kind of focus on pork, 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 pork. And as as important as that is. Uh, if you want to have, in, in, for my life, uh, just the, the, the f- uh, fulfillment, there has to be that level of balance there. Now, um, now I'm, you're maybe thinking, well, I'm a balanced guy. I, I don't know because I'm pretty passionate <laughs> about pork. But anyhow, that, those would be some of the, the, the gleanings or, or the interests that I would have just to kind of create that balance 
to help me be uh, a, a you know a, a servant to our society, but also to our our uh, to pork producers and my involvement in the past. No, it's, it's important to 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 read more than just pork. <laughs> so that's why we asked yeah. that question, right? Yeah, yeah, to yeah. Get, to get an idea of what what other things people are looking at. Yeah. So, so our our final question is, you know, when you when you look back um, at leaders or producers within the industry that are particularly successful, you know, like what is a characteristic that makes them more successful than say they're they're someone who might not be uh, as successful? I would say attitude. I would say integrity and openness to change are three pretty strong pillars for for um, being professionals in, in our in our sector um, so you know attitude when every when everything is down and it's and, and the economics are horrible um, the, the attitude of well it's going to get better how do we what can we do today just to do our part to stay in the game um, the integrity of course is again how do you how do you do that uh, and and then the openness to change, where as time goes on, there's uh, and as you know, Dan, there's been a tremendous amount of change in how we do things, whether it's uh, genetics, equipment, feed, ingredients, environment, on and on and on. And and I and I believe again, those those three are core to make a pretty strong foundation of of a swine professional. I, I think that fits with our discussion today, right? When, when things are doom and gloom, you have to have the attitude that there's gonna, it's gonna get better, but also be open, you know, to, to changing things and, and testing and trying out trying out new stuff. Otherwise, yeah, you're not gonna be successful. I would I would agree with that. So yeah. Well, that brings us to the end. <laughs> so I hope that this was a a, a good experience for you and and. Uh, really um, hope that the, the listeners get something out of it. And I'll thank you again for, for coming on and sharing your wisdom and, and spending your time with us. Well, it was, it was a, for sure a great opportunity. And, and, you know, kudos to you and your folks there that are putting these podcasts on. Um, you know, not that many years ago, this was kind of a foreign concept, right? Where we could, where we could, uh, from, from, from your business or home and my business or home connect up and then for, for the world to actually be part of it. So I think it's a great thing where, where uh, uh, it'll, it'll create more and more dialogue and, and that's exactly what we need in our sector. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So again, thank you. Thank you for coming on and, and we'll maybe have you on in the, in the future when we have more, more stuff to discuss. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I always thanks. do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you.